Welcome to Bible 360, 1 Thessalonians. This is one of Paul's very first letters. Starting in the synagogue, Paul preached the gospel. Some Jews and Greeks believed, including some very leading women in the city. However, after only three weeks there, some of the Jews who did not believe stirred up trouble against Paul. They formed a mob and they dragged Paul away from the house where he was staying. He was brought before the city authorities and accused of being anti-Caesar. And this group was so anti-Paul and anti the gospel that they Eventually, they would even follow him to the next city in Berea and cause further trouble for him there. But having been abruptly ripped away from this fledgling congregation, Paul was worried, especially since they were going to continue to face pressure. He sent Timothy to check up on them, and then he heard, thankfully, that the congregation was actually flourishing. The first three chapters are personal and encouraging. Chapters 4 through 5 contain further clarification and instructions on how to live as a Christian. Paul joyfully recalls how wonderful it was when the gospel took root so swiftly in that congregation during his brief time there, and how the church and Paul's own traveling company had bonded so quickly over the gospel. God's Holy Spirit was clearly moving among them. Paul had heard how decidedly they had pivoted away from serving idols to serving the living Lord Jesus Christ. Paul encourages them, telling them that their action and conviction, even in the face of persecution, was an inspiration to other believers in that same region. Paul assures them that he did not leave voluntarily. He had been concerned and, and praying for them ever since he'd left. He'd even made plans to come back, but he had been stopped by Satan. That's why he sent Timothy to go when he couldn't go himself. And he was delighted with Timothy's report and was touched that they'd missed him as well. His prayer is that they would continue to abound in love in preparation for Christ's return. Paul says that Jesus had rescued them from the coming wrath of God. Now this righteous anger of Yahweh is the result of a selfish, hateful, and destructive world. Those who kill, covet, and oppose God plan of reconciliation and redemption in Christ will tragically find themselves on the wrong side of things when they come before the judgment seat of God. Paul's actually trying to comfort the Thessalonians, reminding them that what is coming is not for them, but that they've actually been saved from this coming wrath through the protection and intervention of Jesus. Despite troubles and persecutions as Christians, God has not forgotten about them, but will in fact redeem and rescue them. The gospel is far more valuable than money, and it's a privilege to participate even with Christ in his sufferings when it glorifies God. Paul appeals to them to remember the concern that he and his company had for them. Uh, we didn't come to flatter you or to fleece you. Rather than being pushy, we were gentle among you because we loved you and you in turn loved us as well. Paul uses a lot of family imagery comforting believers who were estranged probably from their family due to the commitment to the gospel over commitment to the traditional views of their families. Paul refers to himself first as their child, but later describes the work of he and his fellow apostles like Timothy and Sylvanius as being more like a nursing mother to them. Uh, then he compares himself sort of to a delighted and encouraging father teaching a child to walk. Chapters 4 through 5 are more the nuts and bolts of living as a Christian in a pagan world. He encourages the Thessalonians to be in control of their bodies, not controlled by their desires and sinful lusts. Living out of control sexually hurts not only you, but others, and we have a greater purpose than this. He reaffirms the very compassion and service that they have been doing as essential. All he asks is that they continue to do this and do so more and more. Their lives it, are not about advancement, possessions, or personal gain, but about the gospel. They've been called and included in Christ. Their lives were now an opportunity to both show love to others and through their love and service to make the gospel community a shining example of how life could and should be. Paul also addresses the question of their eternity in Christ, in part because there were some doubts and also there were some mournful questions from those who had lost loved one, perhaps even to martyrdom. Since Christ had not yet returned, they were concerned about the eternal welfare of their Christian brothers and sisters who had died. Paul assures them that following Christ was no waste. When Jesus returns, even those who had died would be raised up and would go out to meet Jesus as a welcoming party when he returned to renew the heavens and the earth. Although those who mourned were hoping for a very imminent return, Paul does not know or promise when Jesus will return. All Paul promises is that Christ returns will come without warning. So continue to live preparing for his coming. Be sober-minded. After all, you're not just coping to get through life. You're living for something. Perhaps because he can't be there, Paul urges them to be grateful and respectful of those who are in spiritual authority in the church. Paul commands the idol to do something worthwhile. He encourages the church to encourage the faint-hearted and weak, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing. 
thing. Lastly, he tells them to test beliefs and attitudes according to Christ's example in the Word of God. Be constantly on the lookout to do good, not evil, even to your enemies. He closes by telling them to share this letter around, and he encourages them to be completely devoted to Christ until Jesus returns, relying on God's faithfulness to build them up until that day. As we continue as those who are waiting for the return of our King, we are reminded today to live as the forerunners of God's coming kingdom. And that means being faithful, even in the face of opposition or loss. Our witness to the world is to live as if forgiveness is real and as if Jesus truly is the King of all creation. Sometimes that means that we're countercultural. The reason is because we have been called to help others see what it really means to be a human being. God's people provide an example of genuine fellowship and compassion for one another. By our life, even maybe our suffering and death, we show the world that it is not only possible, but preferable to rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ and His promises.